thank you so much to the UN office at Geneva, UNOC, and also the World Academy of Art and Science for hosting this conference online today, talking about global leadership for the 21st century. And we need that leadership. Clearly, uh, 2020 has been the year of planetary emergency. We're facing a triple crisis for health, climate, and nature as well. Uh, we have some very distinguished panelists today with us, uh, starting with Sandrine dixon de Clev, the president of the Club of Rome, uh, Mami Mitsutori, who is uh, uh, the UN Assistant Secretary General, Special Representative of the SG4 Disaster Reduction, Mr. Michel Jarreau, who is here with us. I can't see Michel for now, maybe he's joining later. Uh, Mr. Bruno Pozzi, Bruno, very nice to be in touch again. Uh, you are the head of the, um, of the UNEP and uh, Europe office here in Geneva. Oliver Greenfield, convener of the Green Economy Coalition. Welcome, Oliver, I can see you are with us. And Anna Hanhausen, uh, very pleased to have you with us on, uh, you're going to be our youth ambassador today. Uh, you are an event coordinator working on plastic oceans in Mexico and also a mentor. So welcome. We're going to start very soon, uh, trying to catch up on some time. So let me just give the floor right away to Sandrine dixon de Clef, who is going to talk to you about the Planetary Emergency Plan. We've been working together on the Planetary Emergency Partnership for more than a year now. It's been growing for from 30 to 300 partners, including partners from the UN, from governments, from academia, civil society, business as well. And uh, it's been a, an amazing adventure working all of us together to deliver impact for people and the planet. Over to you, Sandrine. Thanks so much, Elise. And we're, we're really excited to be here and to be with all the distinguished speakers because you're really bringing a different perspective to something that we call the planetary emergency. And that's really the convergence between climate and nature and also pandemic tipping points. And what we're trying to do at the Club of Rome and working with partners is to leverage 50 years of thought leadership for people, planet and prosperity. We have to take the premise that came already from the limits to growth. And if you read this slide, I'm sure Anna will recognize it as a youth ambassador. Already in 1972, we indicated that this supreme effort is a challenge for our generation. It cannot be passed on to the next. The effort must be resolutely undertaken without delay and significant redirection must be achieved during this decade. That was in 1972 and here we are 50 years later. And we know that since then, we now have not only one singular crisis, which is the health pandemic, but a convergence of a series of crises that are breaking down the healthy planet and healthy people that we actually want. We're moving not only from a climate change series of disasters into a series of pandemics, into a series of nature loss and ecosystem loss. And this is what we call a deep systems crisis. And it's rooted in a number of interconnected global challenges. As I've indicated, all of these different crises are predominantly being created by the interaction between too much destruction and, and moving into the planetary boundaries, high density living and also trade, all affecting the way in which we're now starting to see a culmination of different tipping points. So where are we today? We really feel that 2020 marks the beginning of a decade of action, that this is also the time that we're going to see the greatest economic transition in history. We've got social tipping points from mass movements, political progress, market forces, and technological disruption, all culminating with our natural tipping points, zero carbon needs, zero loss of nature needs, zero poverty, and zero pandemics. That's where we want to go. So how do we do that? How do we ensure that the globe doesn't move back rather than moving forward? And we talk a lot with obviously governments who are saying that we have to build back better. Well, our argument and my argument is clearly, you cannot build back glaciers that have already melted. You cannot build back old growth forest. That's we true. have to totally rethink the way in which we people and nature and climate can actually live together because the climate will continue to change. Let's be clear. 
Many of our members at the Club of Rome, distinguished scientists are already saying that we're too late. But we don't want to just talk about the emergency. We want to talk about the emergence. So this planetary emergency plan that actually we developed two years ago with the Potsdam Institute and WWF turned into a, a large movement where we brought in, and as Elise indicated, several different types of partners, organizations at first that turned into 300 organizations working together. But it also turned into a series of pledges and influencing a series of different jurisdictions. So we have now 1,788 jurisdictions that have declared a climate emergency. We have 80 countries that have actually signed a pledge for nature and people. And we have 33 countries now, not just 31, that have moved on and also made these declarations. So what we're trying to say is, yes, we're in an emergency, but if we commit to the protection of global commons and the way in which we introduce very clear targets and timetables over the next 10 years, we could potentially make it. But these are big shifts. For example, by 2025, halting all conversion of wetlands, grasslands, and savannas, or by 2030, declaring critical ecosystems as global commons. These are just some of the examples of the 10 key commitments that we have for the global commons. But we need to link that to the 10 urgent actions for the transformation. And this is where all of you who are sitting on the panel and those who are listening each have to start to make a determined call because we have to do three key things. Create just and equitable societies. Again, looking at those social tipping points with the planetary tipping points, understanding where the stewards of our land truly are, but then transforming energy systems, very clearly pulling out of fossil energy, tripling our investment into renewables and ensuring that we have a strong carbon price. But we often talk just about carbon pricing and not the full costing of externalities. And that means we need to totally shift to a circular and regenerative economy. This is the third key pillar of what we call the 10 urgent actions for the transformation. So both shifting and decreasing by half our impacts, our consumption and our production footprints by 2030, but also internalizing those externalities and ensuring that we have proper roadmaps. This leads us, we think, to what's now very much well coined as the 21st century well-being economics. Myself and Eileen McLeod, who used to be the uh, Minister of Environment for Scotland, published this new thinking around 21st century well-being economics and the way in which we can introduce this to recovery and renewal and resilience in Europe. And it takes those original key indicators that I spoke about in terms of the convergence of tipping points between economics, social, and environmental. It means that we need to have core indicators for each of those. And we already have some governments that are doing this. We also have cities that are starting to implement donut economics. Very similar type of approach where we start to see how we can interact with our economies without having an impact on our planetary boundaries. And I think it's really important, as one of our members indicated just recently, David Corden. And if you look at these two hands, that our lives are in our hands, and they're in the hands of so many people together, we can do this. We need a re-articulation of human development for the 21st century. We're not in 1972 anymore, but the same issues are coming to haunt us. We have to redirect our purpose from growing GDP to securing the well-being of people and planet. And now is the time to focus on measures of well-being. So these are my concluding remarks. Where does that leave us? How do we emerge from emergency? And how do we transition to sustainable prosperity? We have to guarantee the human dimension. But within this time of important considerations for lives and livelihoods, we have to put in place a decade of action. And that means we need to address three key areas, the political landscape. And here in Europe, we are moving forward, though in some cases not fast enough. If you look at the pushback on policy on common agricultural policy, for example. We also have China and now finally the US coming back. We have biodiversity and climate high ambition goals, and we have increasing support for what we call nature-based solutions. But the big players are missing. The US is still not completely here and we have Brazil and Russia. 
We have to look at the business landscape. We have to build on the Paris collaboration, ensure that we truly do have price parity and shift to renewable energy, and look at all of the different value chain experience that we're now starting to get from COVID. And then the most important, if we're gonna make this work, and I hope in our panel we'll be able to discuss this further, we must bring people on the journey. We can't just focus on Fridays for the Future, Extinction Rebellion. We need to bring in the younger generation, but all generations and all different actors. That means we need to have enhanced collaboration and we need to ensure that we truly put in place a democratic process that empowers people to feel that they're part of the change. So I'm gonna leave it at that, Elise. I hope that I've struck some thinking from all of you and that we can really unpack how you emerge from emergency together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sandrine. And on, on Saturday, we also celebrated the fifth anniversary of the Paris Agreement. And this planetary emergency is also about the climate emergency. We've, all, we've heard the uh, UN Secretary General calling on all countries to declare a climate emergency. So that was a very clear signal. And there were 24 countries that did commit to carbon neutrality, but we know it's not enough. We need more climate ambition and more action at the domestic level, at the local level, on mitigation, but also on adaptation. So resilience really needs to be at the center of our recovery plans in 2021. And now we're going to hear from Mami Mitsutori, who is actually the special representative to the SG, who's been calling for a climate emergency declaration on the weekend. Um, we would like to hear from you in your experience. You, you have this amazing network of countries, but also cities that have experience in building resilience. How do we make it happen? And how we can, can these efforts be scaled up in 2021? And what can we all do to support you in this uh, tremendous task? Thank you very much, Ms. Buckle. And um, the scene has been said so eloquently and uh, very powerfully by Ms. Dixon de Um I'd like to thank uh, uh, being invited to this very exciting um, session and this in important event about leadership and how we can together overcome all these global issues. And um, as I was introduced kindly by uh, Ms. Buckle, uh, I'm in charge of disaster risk reduction in the United Nations which is about prevention. And so um, I'd like to ask you to allow me to start some talking about disaster risk reduction because it's very much uh, related to the issue of environment and climate and the impact of um, extreme weather events, the impact of degraded environment can be really seen in how disasters are uh, destroying our lives. And I don't think really that there is nobody who can ever object that reduced number of people who die by, from disasters, or affected by disasters, or economic loss, uh, damaged infrastructure by disasters, reducing all this, who would, uh, re re who would object to it, right? And I don't think that um, people would object that, yes, we need a plan, um, as Elise just mentioned, and a strategy uh, to have in place and those plans should have multi-hazard early morning systems because as Ms. Um, uh, Dixon uh, de Clay said, uh, we're not being hit by one uh, disaster or two, but multiply right now in COVID-19 uh, with hurricanes, with earthquakes, uh, with floods. And what is happening is that um, we're all being impacted, but in particular, the least developed countries and the small island developing states, which do not have resilience uh, because they don't have uh, the resources to build them, they are being affected terribly. Um, but there is actually a global blueprint, a global plan to deal with this, which has the targets and goals that um, uh, has been um, started to um, been talked about today. These are targets and uh, goals to, as I just mentioned, reduce the number of people dying, affected. Um, and the, it's called the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction 2015-2030, which was adopted at the same time, same year as Paris Agreement. Actually, it was one of the first of the global agreements that were all uh, adopted in that year, five years ago. And 
but I must say that, of course, you know, we have these um, goals, uh, the Paris Agreement, and of course, the Sustainable Development Goals, but uh, the devil is in the detail when it comes to implementing these, and it is really about what is the quality of leadership that is going to allow us to really uh, implement these goals. Uh, we have been uh, campaigning for one thing, and this is about governance. This is about good risk governance, because we think that in order to really generate leadership for anything, but something as difficult sometimes as prevention, you really need to have good risk governance. And our campaign did actually start long before COVID-19 outbreak. And sadly, COVID-19 has shown us that those governments which had a better plan, a strategy, a better risk governance uh, structure uh, was successful in having less people dying or being affected. And we, we see that you know, uh, those uh, governments or those, let's say, uh, people who have not been very successful in having risk governance, good risk governance, the achievement of the SDGs is becoming very difficult. Um, and this is what the Secretary General has already said, because really nothing undermines um, SDGs like disaster. Let me just give you three examples. SDG number one, poverty eradication. So many people lose their homes and thrown into extreme poverty because of extreme weather events, but now by COVID, uh, because they're being displaced. SDG number 11, sustainable communities and cities. Um, Ms. Um, Baku just mentioned about the cities. Yes, uh, the cities are at the forefront of resilience and uh, response recovery from disasters but actually what is happening is that the population growth, rapid informal urbanization is fueling um, the devastation of environment and importantly, the SDG number 13, climate action. 90% of the major uh, disasters of the past 20 years are related to extreme weather events, to climate um, change. And these are the floods, the storms, the wildfires that we have been seeing every year, but very much this year as well. And so how do we tackle all this? Um, the people who drafted the Sendai framework, the member states, they put the main responsibility for protecting their citizens, uh, they put it on the governments, which needs to have strong political leadership. But the important thing is that Sendai framework says it has to be a whole of society approach. We are all responsible. And now in the middle of ongoing pan pandemic, we will be making a very big mistake if we are not all conscious about this, that this is, because COVID-19 is also a disaster that has been written into the Sendai framework caused by a biological hazard. We must all be mindful that if we don't have the courage to uh, recover better, if we don't all take leadership uh, under a good governance structure, then we won't have a resilient, we won't have a green, we won't have an equitable recovery from COVID-19 disaster, and we will be missing an opportunity because we can change this crisis into an opportunity. And this is all about um, good risk governance. Now, um, we know from a survey that we conducted some years ago at UNDRR, UN Office for Disaster Risk Reduction, that Persons living with disabilities are rarely consulted about their needs in disaster settings. And I think, unfortunately, this is true for other vulnerable groups. So the key leadership issue for us when we're taking action on climate and environment is to really break down those barriers that are against inclusion so that we can co-own the leadership and that is the only way that we can really have a whole of society, whole of society approach. The practice of disaster risk reduction, climate change, mitigation, adaptation, and environmental protection, it has to be people-centered and encouraged by engagement and representation of all groups of society. And we are going to have over the next year and a half, convening a series of regional global conferences which are called platforms for a reason, because they bring together governments, they bring together the cities that was just mentioned, bring together the civil society, the private sector, academia, media, UN system, and importantly, the most vulnerable groups. So we do need to bring in the voice of the young people who are so frustrated with 
this vested in interest that um, many people have, many institutions have, which resist change, and they are calling from change. We also have to bring in the women and girls who are really impacted by the climate change to start with, but now with COVID-19 and the energy and idealism of these people who are most vulnerable to bring them in so that they are part of the change, they are part of the solution, is the only way that we can really build a more resilient planet. So whether the goal is to save rainforest or improve flood control or rein in greenhouse gas emission, the important thing is that we need to encourage more diverse and distributed forms of leadership. And that is the only way we can really make a difference in this decade of action. We have already finished one year almost, which has been a devastating year, but uh, we all need to do better. And it's a shared responsibility. It's a shared co-owned uh, leadership. So thank you very much for um, uh, inviting me and for organizing this very timely debate on the future that we want. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mami, for, for this really inspiring speech. And you're totally right. People at the center, women at the center, youth at the center. I'm so glad that Anna is with us today because you don't need to be 50 or 60 years, 60 years old to be a leader and make change happen. Uh, we now have the pleasure of welcoming Mr. Michel Jarraud, former head of WMO. Uh, Michel, I remember meeting you about 10 years ago in your office uh, when I was working with Julia Martin Lefebvre, preparing for the Bali COP. And at the time already, you were telling us this is really urgent for all species, including human beings. We're mm -hmm. now in 2020, and I think that climate impacts have been accelerating and trig you know, triggering multiple tipping points around the world, uh, the Amazon forest burning down, the ice melting very quickly, uh, the coral reef also disappearing in Australia. So the emergency is even more present today. Uh, there's been a lot of changes on the geopolitical front. Luckily, the EU and China has been, have been forging ahead. Uh, the EU with the Green New Deal and China announcing their new carbon neutrality plan uh, to be reached by 2060. And we're so happy now that the US is coming back on board uh, with the Paris Agreement. So Michel, can you share your wisdom with us and what is it that we can expect for COP26 in Glasgow next year? What would success look like for you? Well, thank you, thank you very much, uh, uh, Elise, for, for, your, um, for your introduction. Um, you're right. When we talk Together, many years ago now, it was the issue was urgent and it's even more urgent now because very precious time has been uh, wasted uh, in the meantime. And uh, I want really to, to, to thank very, very sincerely uh, the World uh, Academy of Art and Science and the UNOP organizing this conference because this is a theme which is often perceived as important, but very few meetings have addressed the core of the issue of, of leadership, because it can mean it can mean many things, many things. When you talk about uh, uh, changes required in leadership, it is important to first understand what are the problems, the key problem, the urgent problem that we want to solve. And as was mentioned by a number of interventions, both in this session, but also in the other sessions before, we are facing a new context, which is uh, where there is a multiplicity of, of, of crises, many of them interconnected, and interconnected in a very, very complex way. And many of them have a global dimension. So we're not talking only about local decision, we are really talking about the problem with a global uh, dimension. We saw also in the beginning of this uh, new uh, century, a re-emergence of populistic, nationalistic approach. My country first, my region first, my community first, or even my personal interest first. This is extremely worrying from my perspective for handling some of these uh, uh, global issues. In parallel with that, we, also, we have also been witnessing a very serious decline in the concept of solidarity. And I will come to, uh, to that in a, uh, in a minute. This crisis, as we could see from the pandemic, but also uh, from many other uh, crises, 
health, terrorism, refugees, economics, food security, and of course, uh, environment, they cannot be solved in isolation, uh, even by the largest countries. They have to be solved in, in, in a common way, in a, in, a, in a collaborative way. Of course, in, in, in my uh, next points, I will focus uh, uh, on the angle from the climate change uh, and environment issue, but, but they are all, as I said, interconnected. Now, focusing on this angle, it is impossible to, uh, to look, to study climate variability and change uh, without a global perspective, without global exchange of data. And all countries, even the largest one, even USA, even China, even Europe as a whole, uh, get more from this exchange than what they give away. Uh, Mami was talking about disaster, uh, disaster reduction. We cannot do proper early warning without a global exchange, a global uh, perspective. So this is absolutely fundamental. And this leads me to the next point, because we are also talking about the future or the changes required to multilateralism. But we cannot, uh, uh, we cannot deal with this issue in a bilateral fashion. UN is just under about 200 uh, members. Now, with 200 members, to deal with this issue, you would need about 20,000 bilateral uh, agreement. This is utterly uh, inadequate. So we, we, we need to properly uh, analyze what needs to be uh, changed, improved in the multilateral system. We also need, and that was clear from the various intervention because uh, they have all looked at the issue from different angles. We need a multidisciplinary approach. Uh, this is done to some extent, but it is not done to, uh, to the extent which is sufficient to, to address these issues. Most major challenges associated with Agenda 2030 and the SDGs, actually I could say all of them, are cross-cutting. They, they cannot be, it can be handled in isolation. And at the international level, you can argue that the structures we have in place, which were developed after the Second World War with a very thematic approach, are not sufficient to do that. It doesn't mean they are useless, actually quite the opposite. They are still very useful, but we need also to develop approaches to deal with these cross-cutting issues. And there are a number of examples. Actually, disaster reduction is one of these examples in the UN, in the UN system with the strategy for disaster reduction. There's another example in the UN system about the coordination of water issue with UN water. There are a few examples of what we can, we can do. But what, what I want to also, the point I want to make is that this is not sufficient to deal with it at the uh, international or intergovernmental level. Often when I was meeting ministers or ambassadors, they were saying, you need to better coordinate. And I said, yes, of course, I fully agree. By the way, how do you do it at the national level? Because you see, we need to have a similar mapping at all levels, international, national, but also uh, more and more at, uh, at uh, other levels, like the region, the city, all the levels where key decisions are, are being made. We need to encourage cooperation across disciplines, and some of these disciplines do not have the, uh, the uh, culture to work together. I was listening with great interest to the presentation by Sandrine, and, 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 and she, she made a, a similar, she made a similar uh, point. For example, when it comes to climate change, uh, the climate scientists and the economics do not have a strong tradition of working together. We need to encourage uh, uh, that more. Efforts have been made but they are not yet uh, uh, sufficient. We need to encourage, and that's about really leadership as well, managers, decision makers to deal with complex matrix. Of course, we are all familiar with the complex of matrix management, but here we are dealing with an incredibly complex matrix where all the elements of the matrix interact with each other. You cannot address all the interaction, impossible. So you need to identify what are the key ones, the one where uh, uh, which where you can have the best reward by investing more on these uh, on these uh, on these elements. So a new governance is required at all levels, and that implies a new approach to leadership. Now let me develop a little bit further what it means for decision making. When it comes to climate change, decision making. Oh, sorry, I'm talking too much, and Elise tells me uh, decision making. 
The past is no longer a good indicator for the future. So we need to base decision on scenarios, on probabilities, on including the principle of, of precaution. And one of the most important points, and we saw the damage of that point not being taken into account, is that decision makers have to take into account the facts, the real facts, not the, the alternative reality. They have to take into account the scientific evidence, like for the climate, the information provided by IPCC. They need to integrate longer time horizon, not short term horizon. And we need, and I will not develop that further because it was mentioned by so many people, we need to involve so many new actors, not only government, private sector, civil society, and will not develop that uh, uh, further. We need to have uh, heads of states and government who act more as statesmen, not as politicians. Uh, we need to, to, to have people with a vision which goes much beyond the next election or, or re-election. There have been encouraging signals from USA recently and from other, uh, from other, but it requires much more. It's not only about USA, it requires much more from many other countries. So my conclusion, Elise, I'm, I'm stopping there, is that I also, the last point I want to make, Let's put back solidarity at the center of decision making. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michel. And you're right that all these crises are interconnected. So we really need to address them through a cross sectoral approach and also through a lot of solidarity, working all of us together, coming from our various uh, communities. There's also a question for you and for Mani for later on how we can develop innovative proposals to support adaptation in the face of these multiple crises, COVID-19, climate change, malnutrition. So that's also uh, coming to the same point. Um, we're now going to turn to Mr. Bruno Pozzi, who's the director of UN Environment Program here in Geneva. Uh, Bruno, it was a pleasure to work with you and, and your colleagues last year on the Nature-Based Solutions Coalition, supporting the leadership of China and New Zealand. And uh, the goal was really to scale up nature-based solutions and to, to advance this action agenda for climate, people, and nature. So trying to deliver these multiple opportunities and win-win-win opportunities for climate, people, and nature. Uh, indeed, nature can help us to achieve at least a third of the emission reduction needed to, to reach the goal of the Paris Agreement. Uh, investing in forests and ecosystems can help us to reverse the biodiversity loss and also create lots of jobs and support livelihoods. And this is a time of crisis and we, we desperately need these solutions. So Bruno, can you tell us a bit more about this nature positive recovery? What are the solutions? How can we scale that up in, uh, in 2021? Thanks, thanks a lot Elise and really a pleasure to be uh, on this panel and thanks uh, to the organizers for uh, giving us the space uh, to, 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 to engage. And, and I must say, before I start with, with the small uh, 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 points, the few points that I've prepared, I, I'd like to, to, to come back on, on, on what Michel just said and really underline indeed the need to have a strong multilateralism uh, that deals with environmental uh, matters. Uh, I, I often say the 21st century will be a century of environmental multilateralism or will not succeed. So, so it is the task of our generation, the next, and maybe the one after the next. So it, it is a long, long-term engagement and we need to build this as leaders uh, in the multilateral world. Uh, There's gonna be a bit of repetition, of course. We, it has been said we are at, at very critical juncture with the triple planetary crisis. And, and yes, it is a biodiversity loss. It is climate change, this pollution, uh, this is uh, afflicting our earth and the, the basis of, of, of our uh, sustainable development uh, that we uh, are putting at risk. Uh, we've had the uh, second hottest year on record in 2019. We see that 2020 might be the warmest actually ever recorded. And uh, uh, we know that the air that we breathe all around the globe is, is not is not safe uh, most of the time and we know that there is a risk of of a mass extinction uh, for more than one million plant and animal species but but we not we're not changing <laughs> we're not changing fast enough and then uh, on top of it we've seen crises like covid-19 uh, with with the virus nature uh, sending us a message that our way of life uh, based on producing consuming polluting is is not sustainable so so let's do something and let's try to change that five years uh, since the adoption of the uh, paris agreement um, and and before i touch on nature based solution which indeed can provide 
a large, large part of the answers. Uh, uh, we, I'd like to, to touch on, on, on where we stand with uh, today, uh, the green gas emissions. And UNEP, you know, we, we try to, uh, like WMO and others, we try to bring uh, data together, to bring the science together and give uh, uh, policy advice, uh, being this interface between the science and the policy design. And, and, and therefore we've, we've, we've just issued three reports that are really alarming. There's the emissions gap report that was released last week that shows that even with the slowdown, even with an economy which still has to recovery, uh, we're not going to make a real difference uh, uh, if we don't act. Uh, we are going to witness a drop of up to 7% of carbon dioxide emissions this year, but this will translate in a mere 0.01 degree reduction of global warming by 2050, which shows the extent or the magnitude of the challenge in front of us. And so we still currently, five years after the Paris Agreement, adding for at least a three degree temperature rise in this century, which is really dangerous and really making the planet not sustainable. To get back on track, we will need to cut around a third of uh, uh, CO2 emissions by 2030. And to get to 1.5 degrees, which is the aim of the Paris Agreement, we need to have them. So, so how do we do that? And how do we decrease uh, the use of fossil fuels, basically? We need to transform. We need to look at a transformative models and change uh, uh, our economic uh, uh, the, the way we do the economy. Uh, economy uh, is really the, 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 the link of our societies, uh, but uh, the way we do it is unsustainable, in, both in terms of production and in terms of consumption. And this is shown in the production gap report, which is another report that we've just published, which shows that we need to decrease fossil fuel production by around 6% every year until 2030, if we have a chance of, of, of meeting the targets of 1.52 degrees uh, uh, global warming by the end of the century. And a last report that I want to mention is a report we've, we've just published as well on uh, buildings and constructions, which uh, shows that uh, uh, the way we build, the way we develop, and we know that there's demographic pressure as well uh, uh, on our planet Earth, is uh, contributing very strongly to the CO2 emission. The, 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 the building and construction sector is about 38% of the total global CO2 emissions. So with all of this, it, it gives a, a very, very dark picture, but, but, there is a, but there is a strong potential for a post-pandemic green recovery where we put nature at the center and when we build a green recovery that could if we use a nature-based solution, if we use a new uh, set of governance in, and, and if we respect, we've put environment protection and restoration at the center of our economic decisions, we could cut up to 25% of the emissions by 2030. So meeting then uh, a lot of the goals that have been set by the uh, global community. Nature-based solution, policies uh, uh, the, 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 is the mix that we need to look at so that we lower the, the carbon consumption. This implies as well energy efficiency, this has been said, and a transition away from, from the fossil fuel, which means as well uh, redirecting investments and getting the finance sector uh, to support innovation and, and transformation away from fossil fuels. At government level, it means as well a number of fiscal responses uh, that uh, the pandemic and the recovery plan uh, give us the possibility to address. And with all of that, then there is a chance that we can uh, uh, really meet uh, the targets and that we can uh, leave a planet that will be on the way to recovery. And this is also important for us as leaders to, to think of. Uh, it, is, it is a more than a lifetime commitment. It is uh, uh, a number of generations that we'll have to commit uh, to the planet recovery uh, because uh, uh, the risk of, of falling back, of going back, will always be present. So it will, we need to act boldly, we need to act uh, strongly, uh, but we need also to transmit this desire of change to the next generations and then uh, hopefully we, we can uh, continue living on this beautiful planet. Thanks.
Thank you so much, Bruno. We don't want to go back to business as usual, for sure. We want to move beyond that and go towards a truly systemic transformation. Uh, we're now going to hear from Oliver Greenfield. Oliver, you are leading the Green Economy Coalition. And there was also a comment in the chat now saying where well, the first thing we need to transform is our lifestyles. So how do we go beyond this crazy race for more and more production and consumption? And also how do we move beyond just GDP growth towards a well-being economy? There are countries like New Zealand that have developed a well-being budget. How do you see this transformation happening in particular in the context of the post-COVID-19 recovery? Thank you. Um, okay, so the Green Economy Coalition is largely a civil society network and working on economic reform um, and it, it also includes the UN. So this is about leadership um, and I, I, I very much liked Sandrine's opening uh, but there's one thing it's just there's a slight nuance. There's a, there's a, there's, there was a comment that we need to take people with us. Um, I, I just want to challenge that slightly because I think that I, I agree with the sentiment but I actually think that um, the, 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 the changes we've seen in the last few years have largely been people driven. Um, I don't think it's about people um, being brought with us. I think people are driving this agenda. I think the, the rise of social activism has, the Fridays for Future, the Extinction Rebellion, you know, we have seen that has, that has changed the dial. Um, and so people are leading this. And I think that we should probably remember what um, leadership means for me. Um, politicians should serve the people. Um, businesses should deliver what business, what people want. Um, and the leadership that's coming from our people are, are driving this agenda and making it more transformative. So um, I think that what we're seeing in those social movements is, is a global culture change. And, and I su suggest to you that, that culture change eats politicians and businesses for breakfast. Um, and if you get on the wrong side of the culture change, you will be out of power or you will be out of business. And the other thing is on, on those social activists, people don't want to be marching. Those children do not want to be striking on a Friday. They're saying, politicians do your job. Uh, you know, what we have is a huge army of people, ordinary people that want to live in a different way that want different decisions, that want a different economy. And I would suggest that the greatest threat to democracy itself is its failure to deliver economic democracy. And so when we are challenging ourselves with this transition, we fundamentally need to understand how we connect and reconnect with people's lives, with people's decisions, with people's choices and with enabling them to live better lives, to live lives that are more fulfilled, less vulnerable, and decent jobs. So where are people, they want jobs. But this, is, this COVID crisis has put us in a position where we are seeing economic collapse between five and 40% or 50%, depending on which country you're in, job crises. This transition, this transition that we have got such a short span to do, in the, the language of Sidreen is this planetary emergency. I mean, in many places, this sort of commensurate to a war effort. Well, there's no unemployment in a war effort. We have to re-engineer our, our, our energy systems, our food systems, our transport systems, our financial systems, our economic systems, our governance systems, what matters, what measurement. We, we plan, it, it is an extraordinarily short amount of time to retool our whole economy and our whole lifestyles and the, the, the provision of all of those activities. There's an innovation opportunity, which is immense um, an absolutely extraordinary opportunity for all businesses. As long as we start lining up, start lining up the policy direction and the money. And that requires us to think stimulus in the short term and structural in the long term. And it also requires us to think explicitly about one key question, we're back to this people with us, not more than with us, people driving this, people owning this, people manifesting it as if their own implementers of this in their own lifestyles, in their own choices, and in their own voting. So the most important issue for us, and we've done a lot of work on what needs to reform the economy. Um, and if you want to have a look at 20 policies that governments should be taking up, have a look at the Green Economy Tracker. Collaboratively developed through social dialogue over 10 years, 
thousands of individuals and organizations around the world have defined that. But what matters most is this idea of reigniting democracy, reigniting ownership that politicians serve, that businesses deliver to a new culture change. And for that, we're starting to really experiment with um, this idea of the risk. We have another crisis risk, which is the inequality crisis. We all have to also have a crisis in trust. And so this moment is an opportunity for all of us to start to rebuild trust. And in that place, we're starting to see processes of dialogue. We have, we run our own um, green economy dialogues to enable society to engage in policy process. But deliberative democracies, social um, citizens' assemblies, all of these new mechanisms to reignite um, societal ownership, societal leadership, and, and, and a clarity of what society needs and wants. And those reigniting those democratic processes um, and putting in place, really making sure that, that, for example, in the Green Deal, European Green Deal, the success of the European Green Deal is not that it comes, and it's a brilliant piece of work, theoretically, brilliant piece of work, but its success is not that it is rooted in a commission, but that it is rooted in communities. If communities see their lives improving, we won't have the yellow vests. We won't have, we won't have all the kickback. We will have people who see their lives improving, their opportunities to develop. I'll give you a practical example. We could talk about moving to renewable energy, but you've got a choice. You could either have an out of, out of town, huge renewable array of solar PV, or you can make this community energy, where community gets the benefit. Community earns some money. Community is part of the planning process. And those are choices that we make based on whether our community is involved. Community owns the solution and community is telling politicians that we're prepared to put up the cost of this. We're prepared to support you through investment cycles or policy cycles that are too short term to address these, these structural changes because we are benefiting, because we see our lives improve, because we see well-being improve. And because we see our opportunities of decent work being uh, being understood and captured. So my main message here is, look, the answers of how you reform an economy, largely, largely we know it. And it's it, it summarized in places like Green Economy Tracker. Largely we know it. The biggest issue is to overcome trust. And that requires us to be explicit in how we engage with people so that they are the leaders of this. And politicians remember they are serving and businesses are delivering. And I just want one final shout out because this is a UN leadership thing. Um, UN have created a group, a one UN group, Partners for Green Economy, PAGE it's called. It's got UNIDO, um, UNDP, UN Environment. It's been around for at least 10 years. So they've been working with governments for that. And I think that the one UN approach, and I agree completely with the previous say is multilateralism matters. Going it alone will not solve this. Multi UN has shown that um, the page work, it needs to be much, much more, much bigger, <laughs> much more invested in. I'm closing down. Uh, but, but solidarity also means recognizing the voice of people will be what really makes a difference here. Thank you very much. Over. Thank you so much, Oliver, and fascinating to, to listen to you. This big challenge, how do we reunite democracies? And there's a question there about declaring a global constitution for the environment. I don't know about that, but I know there's, there are projects uh, um, being going around about a citizens' assembly at the global level but also various citizens' assemblies in various countries to try to restore the trust in democracy. And that will be a challenge for sure for 2021. Uh, let me now turn to Anna. Anna, you've been leading some really impressive work to protect the oceans as these uh, prisoners of silence in a way. We sometimes forget that the life underwater is as important as the life on Earth. And our survival depends on these oceans that are also pumping carbon and uh, trying uh, and helping us with uh, with global warming. So can you tell us about your experience? And I'm going to give you the closing remarks as well because we are running out of time. So as the youth leader, you will have the privilege of closing this panel. 
Uh, so please do share your reflection on, uh, on the whole session today as well. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you so much, Elise. It's really a pleasure to be here with everyone. Um, am I audible? Just to check. Okay, yes. No. Okay. Perfect. So yeah, um, I have been focused on ocean conservation for almost three years now. And there are many different projects that are being done across the world. So I would like to speak on behalf of most of the youth. So regarding the current crisis right now, I think from my point of view and speaking for a growing number of the youth across the world, the current crisis, both sanitary and environmental, portray our relationship with nature. For decades, the way of developing has been with complete disregard of planetary boundaries. And the sanitary emergency is especially worrying for the youth who know that we are likely to experience such a crisis in the future. With environmental degradation come more pandemics. So this is likely to happen again to us in many years. The climate emergency also hinders our right to both a healthy and a resilient environment. And as Ms. Dixon de Cleve eloquently said in the beginning, um, it is a challenge of our generation and we are on a breaking point to, to take effective action. This has been said on many, many generations, but I think now it's truly the last one that has the power to do significant change. And countless policies have been implemented. Everyone here on the panel knows that you're better than me, <laughs> but only a few countries are on track with their commitments, for example, to keep their temperature, to keep the temperature under 1.5 degrees. We need binding agreements that force our, all countries to change. So how can we make all this happen? How can we ensure this right to a resilient and a healthy environment? I think the key action is systematic change. And it takes into account two main things that um, Ms. Dixon de Cleve also introduced talking about the donor economics and it's taking into account the limits of resources we can use in order to have a healthy environment and the quality, quality of life which meets basic needs of the entire population. This systemic change has many intrinsic actions and ideological shifts that include inclusion because we can't think of solutions that only benefit a few. Innovation and technology really need to take into account those who live in poverty or marginal, marginalized communities. As a whole, we need to recognize that what happens to one happens to all. And to humanity as a whole, we need more empathy in all solutions and in leadership. I think we also need to think of long-term solutions, solutions that consider what's best in the long run and not only what will save us for, for this year or this decade. We really need to think of future generations. And I was, as I was saying before, meeting the needs of everyone because those living in poverty or marginalized communities are expected to feel the worst effect of the climate crisis and are probably not going to focus their efforts on the climate crisis if they need to be concerned on if they're gonna have food that they or where they're gonna get drinkable water. Finally, I would also like to talk about education and how the youth across the world are entitled to know the issues they will face in the future due to environmental degradation in order to adapt accordingly. And I think what is amazing is that the youth across the world are doing amazing projects and amazing, amazing initiatives that had never been seen before, especially as social media allows these movements to grow at a much quicker rate. However, there are some challenges we face when leading these projects. On, on one side, projects need to have a common goal to increase impact. We need collaboration between not only different projects, but between different generations, different countries and different groups. We need these types of dialogues among youth across the world who are doing different projects in order to find solutions that are beneficial to everyone. I think the youth needs to be included and listened to as key stakeholders for all environmental issues, as we are the ones who will face the most, the hardest consequences. And youth involvement needs to go even further into local, national, and global politics, as well as boardrooms. Our voice needs to be listened to. And I think we need more mentorship programs such as the pop movement, which inspires youth to take action through knowledge. We need to empower um, all the youth as Dr. Greenfield was talk talking about just before me. We need to re-engineer, but in order to re-engineer, we need to make STEM more accessible and we need to make um, 
women and new generations and those living in marginalized communities join STEM careers in order to re-engineer solutions. I think this global call for an ideological shift shows that we can prioritize the environment and that action is needed at, at an urgent level. As Ms. Dixon de Cleve was saying in the beginning, only 33 countries have stated the climate crisis as an emergency. I think it's time for more countries to do so because it truly is an emergency. And it is very exciting going back to the current COVID crisis we are facing. It is very exciting that science has achieved a series of vaccines within a year of the outbreak. But we the youth hope that climate action is viewed with the same sense of urgency so we can have effective solutions implemented within a year. I think if it was done for such a big crisis as COVID, it can be done for an even bigger crisis and that threatens our future even more as is climate change. And for my final remarks, I think some really interesting um, ideas were talked about in this panel and many of them focused on ideological shifts and things we need to do at many levels. We need to do it at a local, national and global level. We need to have more empathy. We need to be more resilient. We need to think of trust. We need to rebuild this trust and, re and really create a better community for everyone. I think all the speakers put it in the best words possible, but we really need to work together and in order to empower all generations to become leaders and take action. Thank you so much, Anna, so inspiring. And as you say, we need solidarity, empathy, and, and also there's this motto, you know, one for all, all for one. I think you know that that's reflecting also your, your thoughts. I don't know if there are more questions. We're kind of running out of time. Uh, we started 15 minutes late. Uh, if you have questions, this is the moment. Otherwise, I will hand over to Sandrine for some closing, closing remarks. Thanks so much, Elise, and thank you, Anna, really. Um, first of all, for your inspirational remarks, but also for all the incredible work that you're doing. And you know, there are so many young people on the front lines who are trying to figure out this complexity. Um, and I think that we're all very cognizant of that fact. So we really are indebted to you, but we also need to work together through an intergenerational dialogue so you don't feel alone. And I just wanted to conclude because several people in the chat have asked questions around the presentation, the plan. So yes, we'll make the presentation available. Please read the Planetary Emergency Plan and please join if you want to get active our Planetary Emergency Partnership that Elise is facilitating. And we're really collectively trying to bring together the voices of change and also act. And maybe just to conclude to Oliver's really good point about people and the journey. Yes, there is a huge growth in the activist community, but, but as someone put in the chat, there are many forgotten people too who are not part of this journey and who really feel like they are on the front line of our changes. What we need to do is get better at demonstrating exactly what you've indicated and so many others, that vision that the future is actually better than the present. And it's much more collective, it's much more equitable. And as I often say, Many people talk about the fact that we have to go back to business as usual. But for many, business as usual has not brought them happiness. It's not brought them the prosperity that they deserve. In fact, that's the majority of the population. So let's remember that business as usual for this generation means they're gonna make less than their parents. That business as usual for this generation means increased suicide rates, and increase mental instability. That is not an offer of a bright prospect for the future. So together we can try to work on how we can emerge from emergency. This planetary emergency plan gives some really clear targets and timetables linked to the emergency at hand. And I'm really looking forward to continuing to working with all of you. And thank you so much to Elise for moderating this panel and for all of you for joining us and those who wanted to ask more questions, but weren't able to because uh, we also overran. Have a lovely day. Take care. Thank you so much for joining from everywhere around the world. I saw comments from Pakistan, also a call to the UN to have these sessions translated. And uh, thank you for the good positive spirit, all of us working as one team for one planet. Thank you, have a good day.